All right, welcome back. Yesterday we talked about chapter one. Today we're going to talk about chapter two. There are some uh, homework one and homework two are due tomorrow. It's really one homework. I mean, it's like the size of one homework assignment. We just switched it to make the homework line up with the chapters. So there's two problems from chapter one. The uh, Problem 112, eh, old machine, in-house, 40,000, modify the machine. Oh, okay, this is kind of like the problem we just did, which was a text problem. So kind of go through the same process on that one. And then 18, again, you're given some numbers there. And follow the problem and crunch the numbers and see what you come up with. So 112 is like the one we just did. 118, we're pretty much just going to the, uh, right to the numbers, which is what we'll do pretty much from now on. All right, so chapter two, we're gonna look at some concepts, design economics. The, one of the main parts of it is going to uh, look at different types of costs. And this will come back, so, so uh, test one is chapters one through four. So we don't really hit the, the equations from that sheet of the time value of money until chapter four. So test one will be a couple on the cost estimation methods. We'll see on chapter three and a little bit from chapter two. But this will have a problem that uh, I've put on the final exam the last couple years that given different costs and identify which type of costs they are. So a fixed cost is unaffected by changes in activity. So it doesn't change with operational variables. It can change over time for different projects. So for example, in, if I'm talking about my engineering firm, things like, and by the way, the, the, the uh, switch button for the dock cam gave up the ghost the last time I pushed it, so. We're, we're going with the PowerPoint, and maybe I'll go to the board here a little bit, but. The, uh, so things like, in my engineering firm, I have a lease for my building, that's a fixed cost, administration, insurance, and then mobilization, for example. So for, uh, we, in, uh, or years ago, an underground storage tank, uh, engineering consulting firm that did underground storage tank cleanups, and for our projects, we'd have a, in our budget there, a charge for mobilization, which is basically what it costs to get all our equipment and stuff out to the site and set up at the site. So no matter how much, how many wells we're drilling or how many stuff we put in, there was a fixed cost for that. And it was not dependent on the hours that people put in. The uh, variable cost vary in total with the quantity of output or, or similar measure of activity. That's th things like the labor costs. So the more labor, the more cost. The more materials, the more cost. So labor and materials would be in there. And to get the variable cost kind of underneath the, the category of variable costs, one of the components of the variable cost is what we call the incremental cost. That's, uh, that's like dollars per hour for labor or dollars per mile. For, for driving. So there's incremental costs. 
go into the variable costs are a function of the variable, the hours, the miles, the yards of concrete, things like that. Those are the variables, and then the incremental cost is what we call the cost per unit. Now we can divide the fixed costs and variable costs can fall under a couple different categories. So for example, we have direct costs. So direct costs and indirect costs. Direct costs can be measured as allocated to specific work activity so that's different from indirect costs that, uh, so indirect, you probably overhead is what you more think of. We tend to call that indirect costs. So the uh, direct costs are directly related to the project. The indirect costs are the overhead. The, uh, For example, in the, at the uh, University of Arkansas, we did a research project. We had the direct costs, which would be the things like my salary and benefits, uh, uh, graduate student salary and benefits, all the materials we have travel, that would be all direct, and we would take that all and we multiply it by a number, a percentage, and the, uh, we'd get, that would be the indirect cost. So in addition to the direct cost, we'd add the indirect cost. Anyone want to get, guess what that percentage is? Anybody? The overhead or indirect? Come on, give me a guess. Give me a guess. Twenty percent. Wrong. No, it's, it's a. It's a. That's a pretty good guess. In the collaboratory, we charged. Last time I got a outside contract, we charged fourteen percent indirect rate. At the University of Arkansas, depending on the type of project it was, it was forty-four to fifty percent. So if I added up a small project, again, $100,000 might be a small project by the time you add everything up. If you have $100,000 in direct costs and then you add the indirect, 45%, that's $45,000. So you, your request from the funding agency is $145,000. That sounds like a lot, but that's actually, a lot of universities use higher numbers than that. And uh, I was a reviewer for proposals for a, a federal program. And the universities were usually somewhere between like 45 and 60%. Some of the private firms uh, used 200% indirect. So if we come up with it's $100,000 in direct costs, then we need $200,000 in indirect costs, so the whole project would be $300,000. And that's more a way, of the, a way that they did their accounting and stuff like that. So they had, so anyway, that, that can be a pretty, uh, pretty big number. Yeah, when I found the collaboratory only charged 14%, I was like, that's, that's amazingly low. Do, do, do. I'm going to have you guys do a couple problems here again, but I'll, maybe I'll go through a couple. A standard cost, so these are really, these are the terms we'll use. Fixed cost, variable cost. In, under the variable cost, we get there by multiplying the variable, whatever it is, hours, miles, cubic yards times incremental cost, cost per unit. And then in our budget, those numbers go either into direct costs, 
which is most things, and uh, indirect costs. By the way, the, the federal agencies and stuff have different ways. The university has like uh, indirect was charged on all the direct costs except for they had a different line for equipment over $5,000. So equipment over $5,000, it went under the direct cost, but it was not multiplied by the indirect rate to get the indirect cost. So there's things like that. And some of the agencies, the state agencies especially, had negotiated a special indirect rate, like the highway department only paid 20% indirect. So when you're making the budget for that, you got to take that into account. So. so those are the costs. We can also get some of those numbers from a, what a standard cost, cost per unit of output established in advance of production or service delivery. What does that mean? Well, there are, uh, in industry, there are, for certain uh, types of activities, certain types of construction, things like that, there are standard costs that someone has compiled and said, this is the number you should use in your cost estimation. So we might come back to that later. So there's, the government might have standard costs for things. This is what it costs for it. For example, the, uh, the government pays and every, you've heard the government per diem amount, the amount you can spend on a, on a hotel and food. There's the federal per diem and most like universities like Messiah tends to use the, well do we or do we have a separate Anyway, says we're going to go by the federal per diem. So this is what you can spend for it. So those are standard costs that are established. And different places do it differently. The, uh, I work for EPA and then I work for an EPA contractor. Sat in the same office, the same computer and everything, but I was just officially switched there. And they, for travel, the EPA, I'm trying to remember, yeah, the EPA just paid you, at that time anyway, your per diem. And traveling for the University of Arkansas is the same way. So they just pay you your per diem, what you do with that's your business. The EPA contractor, they only paid uh, specific receipts. So you, you'd have to save your receipts and submit that. And that's how we, we work here also. You have to save the receipts. So, there's the standard numbers that they've come up with how your particular agency or contractor or firm deals with those standard costs may vary. And, all right. This will come more into when we start about talking about taxes of the cash cost and the book cost. Cash cost means that cash is exchanging hands, or, I mean not physical cash, but money is being exchanged. Whereas a non-cash or book cost, and we can also have, uh, I'll put in, uh, I forgot that we had the, I can't write on this screen, can I? I don't know if future person on video can see this. I think so. I think they can see up to about here. But. So a book cost, we'll talk about it with taxes. So if I, I buy a truck for $100,000, first year it depreciates by $30,000. It's now worth $70,000. It has lost $30,000. In my accounting for tax purposes, I, that $30,000 is a loss or an expense of my project. I didn't pay anybody $30,000. I just, the asset I have lost $30,000. And my truck is worth $70,000. 
So I might have pay taxes based on what my truck is worth. I don't have $70,000 in cash there. I have an asset worth of that. So that's the book cost. On my books, that $30,000 depreciation is a loss. I didn't give anybody any cash. It just goes in the books. Another kind of, uh, in uh, a, a, a book cost, would be like in kind. Anyone know, hear that term in kind? So, in again in research projects, you a lot of times for some agencies had uh, you had to do a one to one match. You had to provide matching funds. So, for the uh, the Department of Agriculture, if I wanted $100,000 from them, I had to document that someone else is going to give me $100,000 for that project. Well, what I could do for that is, for this one I'm thinking of, I had a friend who had a landscaping company, and he said, I'll come, so this was a project looking at, uh, at uh, using glycerin as a soil additive. He said, I'll come to the, the field plots and I'll do some landscaping for you on there uh, for free. So it's like, well, how much would you charge for that if I was going to pay for it? Well, I, charged, I would charge $15,000 for that. So I can put that under my project as an in-kind match. No money is exchanging hands, but labor is exchanging hands. I can also put on, and this happens a lot, so the, uh, the university is paying my salary, uh, it's going to pay me no matter what. Instead of paying me, it can pay to the project and have the project pay me. The money is exactly the same. It goes from the university to me, but I can show that on my project as an in-kind that I'm putting in this time on this project. And anyway, so in kind, sometimes it's a way to kind of play with money, but we do the same thing here. We actually come up with a report each year, so that puts numbers on your work on your projects. How much do you get paid for your work on your, your collaboratory projects? Zero. We actually pay you. Yeah, you pay us. <laughs> but, for a pro but we can put out a report saying to our client saying, uh, we had eight students put in 100 hours each, 800 hours, and the value of their time is what? Give me a number per hour. $11 an hour. See, it, we, there's a lot of uncertainty to come up with that. Some, sometimes for federal things, there's federal numbers and stuff. But we can come up with that. So we had 800 hours at $11 per hour. So we have 8,000. Wait, yeah, $8,800. We have we have put into the project. No, that was no cash. It was an in-kind donation. All right. The uh, somebody Google. Second Chronicles, unless you have a Bible with an Old Testament in your backpack. But anyone know? Second Chronicles 25, 5 through 9. Who's got it? You got it, Becca? Yeah, read it, read it to us. Second Chronicles 25, 5 through 9. And Messiah called the people of Judah together and assigned them according to their families to commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds for all Judah and Benjamin. He then mustered those twenty year olds or more and found that there were three hundred thousand men fit for military service, able to handle the spear and shield. He also hired a hundred thousand fighting men from Israel for a hundred talents of silver. But a man came to him and said, Your majesty, these troops from Israel must not march with you. 
for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the people of Ephraim. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy. For God has the power to help or to overthrow. Amaziah asked the man of God, But what about the hundred talents I paid for these Israelite troops? The man of God said, The Lord can give you much more than that. The Lord can give you much more. What about this? So this is what we call the sunk cost mistake or sunk cost fallacy. So this was, was Amaziah was his name. So they paid out this money to hire these soldiers. And God said through the prophet, said, said, don't do it that way, do it this way. And he's like, well, I already paid for these soldiers. And they're like, oh, don't use them. It's going to go bad. You should not do that. But, but I paid for them. I don't want to waste that money. So that's a sunk cost. Now, you've already paid for it. You don't want to waste it, so I better use it. But it, uh, it's, it has no relative to the estimate of future costs. So if you paid money in the past for something, you paid money for this truck, and it's a piece of junk. Well, I don't want to, I paid for it. I don't want to waste it. I better use it. No, it's gone, baby, gone. That's, the, that's what a sunk cost is. It's, it's over. It's gone. And the usually decision to not waste the sunk cost turned out to be bad decisions. Now, the, if I have that truck, I should analyze what it would cost to keep that truck going and stuff like that. So there might be, it might figure it in the analysis that way, but the money that I paid for it for my, for my new project, I'm looking from this point onward, what are my costs, what's the best alternative? The money I wasted in the past doesn't matter. So that's a sunk cost and that comes up a lot in life. In, uh, among other things. All right, the, uh, oh, let me go through a couple more and then I'll, I'll come back to the problems and have you look at it. Opportunity cost is a little different animal. The monetary advantage foregone during, due to limited resources is the cost of the best rejected opportunity. So if I have a dollar and I can use that dollar, I go to the gas station, I can use that dollar to buy a cup of coffee or buy a lottery ticket for a lottery that's worth that's one billion dollars. If I pass up the lottery and I buy a cup of coffee, the opportunity cost of that is a billion dollars. So that cup of coffee costs a billion dollars. Well, what are the odds of winning it? So if I come up, do an economic analysis of that, that billion dollars is, is out there. So it, it says the best rejected opportunity doesn't mean that it was a bad idea to reject it. In that case, it's probably a good idea to reject it. You get more value from that cup of coffee than you would from that lottery ticket. But anyway, that's the extreme example of an of a opportunity cost. Okay, let's... Uh, oh. Let's go back. I'm kind of scrambling here. <laughs> Who has a book? A lot of you, enough of you had a book? Let me, uh, I'm going to turn you loose on, this is kind of our next section, problem 219. So you want to get in your little groups and start that, and I'm going to get... I'll get set up for something else real quick here. 
So look at problem 219. In the meantime, I'm going to go to We'll take another little break and then I'll uh, I'll skip back, I'll go back to the stuff that I planned to do on paper, but I had a little technical problem here. person out there in future land, I have my microphone still on, but you're not missing anything. We're going to work on problem 219. I do actually have. Oh. You know what I think I'm going to do?
Justin, can you reach can you reach the second light thing here? Thank you. I'm tethered here. All right, let's talk through this a little bit. So, again, rather than rather than doing the, we'll come back tomorrow, which is next week, right? The uh, and fill in some of the blanks here. But problem 219, I'm giving that to you because this is one where we're going to start to look at costs and break-even points, and then we'll uh, come back to one where the price is a function of how many units you sell, price-demand relationship. But, but this one isn't like that. So this one, we have a fixed cost of uh, $1.5 million per month and a variable cost of $20 per month per, per, per prescriber, subscriber. But the, uh, the company charges 39 Did anyone actually get through this and cut, come up with a break-even point for it? Michaela's nodding her head yes, so I don't know. Okay, so this one, we said that your total cost is the fixed plus the variable cost. So the fixed plus the variable. So the fixed cost is fixed. It's 1.5 million dollars. I'll get my solution to it. it help. So it's one point five million dollars. And then the variable cost is twenty dollars per subscriber, right? So I'll have a variable called sub. <clears throat> the revenue, that's the other end of things, that's the money coming in. The revenue is the number of subs times <coughs> Thirty-nine ninety-five. Wait a minute. Thirty-nine ninety-five. That's not bad. I wonder what you get for that. I need to look that up. Is that the right number from the book, by the way? Sometimes they. They change numbers between editions, and sometimes I have a printout from the previous edition, and I have to go. Yeah. So what's happening is we have the total cost and the total revenue in dollars. Sorry, I'm hitting you with the. Okay. 
versus the number of units, in this case it's subscribers, right? So our cost is 1.5 million plus the number of subscribers times $20. So it's going to increase like that. Slope of that is $20 per subscriber. The revenue, if I don't have no customers, I don't get no money. So I got uh, zero when there's zero subscribers, but then I'm getting $40, $39.95 per subscriber. And so my I was in here yesterday and I setting up and I still brought my my colored markers instead of my colored chalk. So I should have different colors for this. So this is the revenue. And the slope of that is 39. 95 per subscriber. So I want my revenue to be more than my cost. So I need to figure out how many subscribers I need to make this break even. Now later on in the semester, a month or so from now, meaning next week, we'll, uh, we'll start putting the time value of money into our break-even analysis. But for now, we're just saying, okay, $39.95 each subscriber costs us $20 each subscriber plus $1.5 million to start out with. So what is our, so total cost, And I'll put it over here a little bit. Equals the revenue. I think I have up to about there for, for a future person there in the video. I do have my microphone on, right? Yes, I do. Future person, if I turn my microphone off, you let me know. But <laughs> the, uh, so if I set that up, well, what'd you, what'd you get, right? Some of you did it already? What'd you get? Is that what you did? What number did you get for its a number of prescribers, subscribers, and you get? So if I have more subscribers than that, I'm making money. If I have less than that, I'm losing money, right? And I'll go out of business and be poor. I don't know. Amazon is like has never made money, right? Supposedly. And the Amazon guy is the richest man in the world, so how does that work? But, yeah, I don't know how it all works. But anyway, if I want to make money, I need to have more subscribers in that. And then part B, it says the company currently has 73,000 subscribers. Are they making money? So this is 75,188. This is 75,000 subscribers. They have 73,000. Are they making money? No. Now, if they're the government, they can just raise the, the price and get more money. But if they're a business, if they raise the price, 
someone's going to say, oh, I'm going to go to Sprint or AT&T or somebody. So they come up with a plan. We are going to raise our cost, but we're going to add some stuff to it. And we think maybe we can get more customers that way, or maybe at least hang on to enough customers that we're making money. So, part B, anyone get that far? I want to do part B, figure out the new one. So part B, our new price is $49.95 per sub. And our new cost we still have the same 1.5 million plus our cost per subscriber goes up a little bit. And so then our revenue equals sub times forty nine ninety five. Set my cost equal to revenue. Solve for sub. Anyone do that? Get that far? Sixty thousand. Sixty thousand. That you got sixty. One twenty. One twenty. One twenty one. One twenty one. One twenty. Sixty one twenty ish. One twenty one. It's that last customer we need right there. So this says now we raise the price. We're not making money here. We only have 73,000 subscribers. We need 75 to break even. With that revenue, well, hey, we add, we raise the price, we get more money, right? Well, we might lose some customers, but it turns out that if we raise the price, we only now need 60,000 instead of 75, and we have 73, so we're making money, yay. Well, actually, it says 10,000 subscribers drop their service. So now they're at, where are they at? 63. So are they making money now? Yeah. So now they're making money. By the way, uh, We can, uh, anyway, now they're making money. So that's a way to look at the break-even analysis if we have a, a set cost per unit and a set price per unit. But one or both of those might not remain constant depending on how many units. There's the price demand, if you get that light again, and see if I can switch back to that. I'm scrambling. It's snowing out there. Yesterday I thought, are we going to have our first day snowed out? And were you all driving back and, and hit the snow? Ooh. It was slippery, right about 5.30 or so. It was probably about time a lot of you were coming back. It was really slippery. G 
Okay, let's... Go back, sorry. I'm having to scramble a little bit here with my button dying there. Yeah, that was, what, what did we decide? It was three years ago or two years ago we had that huge storm? Three years ago? It's 35 inches in 24 hours in parts of York County. We were, but the, uh, my brother is like, we, and we grew up in Wisconsin. I was like, ah, it's nothing. We had more than that in Wisconsin all the time. And I'm like, really? I don't... Biggest 24-hour storm in the history of Wisconsin was like 24 inches or something like that. So I'm like, no, actually, we, uh, we never had one that big in Wisconsin. Although I don't really remember having too many snow days either. We did have a lot of snow, but the... Uh, The year I got my driver's license was like one of the biggest snow years ever, and it was, and uh, it was one of those. Some of you were from probably from place. It went from like uh, Western New York or something like that, where they get lots of snow, yeah, and where you the banks are really high around the roads, and then sometimes you just kind of have to pull out in faith. You're like, I can't see. We pull out and hope you don't get hit, but it was like that. The year I got my driver's license, okay. So I said, ha, to my brother. Well, my brother did have, in summer, he's in southern Texas. I'll probably tell this story nine times in Water Resources, but the, uh, he, he was sending me little screen captures of the weather where he was in Texas and uh, a couple summers ago. One day it was 116. And you say, well, yeah, it's a dry heat. The next day it was 107 and raining. It's not a dry heat. It's a very wet heat. Okay. All right, so here's one where the demand is a function of the price. So here we go back to so if we put this variable in there, put this change in there where uh, the the law of supply and demand so if you can sell more you can sell for less or if you buy more, you can get a better price. Like with the, with the meat, if we could buy a whole cow, or half cow, side of beef, we could get a better price. Or the pig, they, so the guy called up my wife the other day and said, I'm taking the, this hog, I'm going to slaughter this hog, are there any specific cuts that you want? She's like, nah, I don't like to think of it that way. I don't like to think of an image of a hog there. I just want generic meat. Anyway, so we can put this into our analysis that now the price, be, rather than being fixed, is a function of the demand. So these units are, so A, the price is A minus B, D. So A is the intercept and B is the slope of that. So A is the price at, you know, if we're selling zero or one, or one of them, and then B is the price, how much the price goes down per demand. So I can put in this, uh, 
The total revenue is plus, uh, okay, this is just what we did, except now we're putting this in there. And so what we're going to have, don't worry about the math so much here, is that like we had before, our total revenue, the more we sell, the more money we're making, right? But then, but as we're going, instead of having a straight line here like we did the one behind the board here, the more we're selling, this slope, this slope is the price per unit, is going down. So we're getting less per unit. So we can get to a point there where now, we're selling more units, but we're charging less for it, that our total revenue is actually going down. So we get that curve in there. So we can do some math on that and find it. But let's do, uh, let's look at the examples. Example 2-4. Company produces an electronic timing switch that is used in consumer. Okay, seventy-three thousand per month fixed cost. Variable cost is eighty-three dollars per unit. So just like we did before, we can come up with our cost, and that'll be a straight line, right? Seventy-three thousand per month. That's the intercept. Variable cost. That's the slope. Eighty-three dollars per unit. The selling price is $180, oh, well, $180 minus, we're going to charge less for it when there's more demand. So we want to determine, again, we're going to have our, I think future person can see to about here, our Cost is seventy-three thousand, and it's going to increase. This is the units at eighty-three dollars per unit. That's the cost. The revenue. <coughs> if I don't sell none, I don't make no money. <coughs> Start selling them, I'm making more money, and this was a straight line before, but now it's going to go up and come down. And hopefully it goes above that line. If it stays below that line, we're not going to make any money, no matter how we figure it. So determine the optimum volume for this product and it confirm that a profit occurs. What is the optimum volume? Is it the most revenue? the most profit. We have a graph of this. So what do we want? Do we want that? Is that the optimum? Or is it the difference between those two? And that's the profit. Okay, let's do, 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 do. Actually, let me, where are we at on time? Let's, do, let me, let me do this one on the board here. Okay. Yeah. All right, I think I can. I think I have to. Everybody stand up and wake up real quick. I've got 41 minutes left on my card there. All right.
Now let's do uh, I'll erase it. All right, so this is example two four. What am I selling here? An electronic timing switch. I'm going to sell them for one million dollars each. Might not sell anybody. If I ever do, I'm in business. So. And then some old joke or something. I'm going to charge a million dollars for it, but if I ever do sell one. All right. So, here's what we got. Again, this is example two, four. This is money. Cost or revenue. The fixed cost is $73,000 per month. All right, so we're going to do month. So it's $73,000. Variable cost is $83 per unit. So the cost is going to go up like that. And the slope of that is $83 per unit. The price per unit is $180. I'm not done with that sentence yet. So if I sell any, it's $180 per unit, but the the more units I sell, the less I'm going to sell them for. So $180 per unit, and it says 180 minus 0.02D, where D is the demand. So it's $180, but then for each unit I sell, I can charge two cents less per unit. So this slope here, this was supposed to be the slope, is $180 minus, this is the demand, 0.02 times D. So as we go up, this slope becomes less, and hopefully it goes above the cost so we can be making money, and eventually it's going to come back down. So we have a couple different points here. We have the points Where we break even, oh, and then we have another break even point. And then we have the, in this region here, we're making money, and we want to know the maximum profit. We want to know where that happens. So we want three points here. We want that break even, that break even, and the max. 
So if we do this, we have if we set cost equal to income, our cost is seventy three thousand. I'll write out the zeros. Plus eighty-three dollars times the demand. We're going to set that equal to the income, which is one eighty minus zero point zero two. D times the demand. So we get uh, the profit equals the cost equals income. So we can solve that for our break even, right? I don't have it written down here. What is it from the book? What does it tell you? If I solve that, I end up with, I get a d squared in there, right? I get uh, going to our Our uh, equation, this is, what do we call that, A? We call this B. This is our demand. We call the price that we're going to get P. And then what are, what's our terms for our costs? We have the C of V is our variable cost. And our C F is our fixed cost. Again, this is A minus B times D times D we solve that we get minus B D squared plus A minus C V times D minus C F equals zero. Might have been easier just to plug our numbers in there, but we can then solve that for D. That's a quadratic equation, right? We can have break even D equals are the roots of that 932 and 3918 
that's one of the things we wanted. The other thing we want is where is the maximum profit? Profit equals income minus cost. I think I lose future guy about here. But. So the income minus the cost, or the revenue, I should use the term revenue. So I get the I'll skip ahead, this is in the text. If I, if I work that out, so this is, e this is if this equals zero, so the profit would be minus b d squared plus a minus cv, well, so I don't lose my future person here. A minus CV minus CF. That's the profit. Set that equal to zero. I solve for the roots. Those are my break even amounts. What do I want to make the most money? What do I want to do with that function? The most money. The, yeah. Yeah. If I want a maximum, I can take the derivative of that. And it turns out that max profit happens when D max profit. That'd be a cool name for someone to have. I'm max profit. Had a boss for a while named Thor Armstrong. How cool is that? Thor Armstrong. So if I do that, then uh, I think I get, if I followed this right, 2425. So that's where I'm making the most profit. I have higher revenue later on, but I also have higher costs. So I'm not making as much money. So my max profit is at 24, 25. All right. I'm gonna come back to couple things tomorrow. Let's talk through the homework and then see if we have time for anything else. All right. So homework one, again, basically the first, it's, we're splitting it up into two homework just to make it to line up with the chapters. Any question, John? You got it? Okay. All right. So, homework two is two, problem two eight. A friend of yours has been thinking about quitting her regular day job going to business for herself. Makes 60000 a year. She believes she can make 200000 as an independent consultant. Her startup expenses, 120000 next year. What is the expected opportunity cost? What, how, how did we define an opportunity cost?
What's the definition of an opportunity cost? Sarah, we remember that? Monetary advantage foregone due to limited resources. The cost of the best rejected opportunity. The best rejected opportunity. So, in this case, she's looking at, she's got $60,000 bird in hand. She can make 200000 she thinks, if she spends $120,000. If she decides to keep her current job, what is the expected opportunity cost of the decision? So there's a quick, the, the calculation is quick. The question is, balance the pros and cons of this option. Remember we said we have to consider uncertainty. All right, 214. A large wood products company is negotiating contract which said plywood, blah, 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 fixed cost. Oh, okay. $800,000 per month fixed cost. So we're going to look at monthly costs. Variable cost per thousand board feet is $155,000. Oh, okay. This is exactly the problem we just did, just with different numbers. Okay. The price will be charged will be determined by the price is $600 minus, notice this in the notes, it says 0.5 times the demand. It's 0 0.05. So that's, there's a typo there. It, makes, it doesn't work out. If you use 0.5, it doesn't work out. So and the, there's a solution that from the text people of the problem, and they use 0 0.05. So that's just a typo there. So this is exactly the problem we just did. This is exactly example 2-4, just with different numbers. Problem 20, a plan operation, okay, 2 million per year fixed costs, we can put out 100,000 per year, costs $40 per unit, sell it for $90 per unit, construct the economic break even chart, okay, so this is like we just did 219. This is essentially the same problem as 219. Compare annual profit when the plant is operating at 90% of capacity. So if they're selling 90,000 instead of 100,000. Assume that the first 90% of the capacity is $90 per unit, but the remaining 10% is $70 per unit. So this is Kind of a, this is a, a hybrid. So it's like 219, the first problem we did. And then instead of having a, a variable cost for P, we're going to look at it, certain cost up to 90,000. And then after that, another different cost. So a little variation on the theme there. 233. I have a couple materials I can choose from. Brass copper alloy weighs 25 pounds. Every pound of extra weight has been assigned a penalty of $6 to account for increased fuel consumption during the life cycle of the car. The brass copper alloy casting costs $335 per pound, and plastic mold is $740 per pound. Machining costs per casting are six dollars for the bread. Okay, which should they select? What is the difference in unit costs? Oh, okay. So this is just kind of a straightforward. Put those numbers together, compare them, and look at the difference in in unit costs. So that's pretty straightforward. And then finally, we have uh, a fastening pin. Now we got lathe time and drill time. 
the variable costs of the lathe, variable costs of the drill, $16.90 per hour. Finally, there is a sunk cost of $5,000 for design A and $9,000 for design B due to obsolete tooling. What do I do with those numbers? Anybody? They're telling you it's a sunk cost. What's our rule for sunk costs? Gone, baby, gone. You can just take a marker and cross out that last sentence. It doesn't matter. So we're going to look at the cost of $125,000 units the, uh, and see which comes out better. And then see that this is, it's got hours and uh, 12 hours of lathe time per, okay, hours per unit and annual savings over between the two, the difference between the two. All right, any questions on anything? I actually had a couple things I skipped. I might come to tomorrow that I had on, on paper with costs if I figure out a way to do it tomorrow. But I'll, I'll turn you loose there. I'll stop future person here. <laughs> <laughs>